My name is David Grimes and I live close to Clitheroe, a small town in East Lancashire in the north of England. My background is until I start, stopped work seven years ago, I was a specialist physician in a large hospital in Northwest England. My practice was in general internal medicine and gastroenterology with a great deal of emergency work. My interest in vitamin D resulted from my curiosity about the geography and sociology of a variety of illnesses and the early deaths of certain groups. This stimulated a great deal of research, but I'm not a biochemist and my research is purely clinical. My knowledge of vitamin D comes from my reading, but most of all from the patients who I treated. I owe a great deal a great deal to them, and many of them are still in my memory. My conclusion was that lack of sun exposure and vitamin D is the main determinant of the relatively poor health profile of people living in the northwest of England and in the northwest of Scotland. The relative good health profile of those living in the southeast of England is a result of more sunlight. The childhood disease of rickets uh, is well known and due to vitamin D deficiency. It was particularly common in Scotland and especially in the industrial city, Glasgow in the West. It resulted from sunlight deprivation due to the new pattern of indoor work and in particular, serious atmospheric pollution during the extensive industrial development of Europe in the 19th century. The very polluted air, even in the mid 20th century, is difficult to imagine today. It was found that rickets could be cured by exposure to the sun, the experience in Austria, or by fish oils, the experience in Scotland. We can still experience the fish oils in herrings, as in the Scottish kippers on the barbecue. Vitamin D is produced in plankton, and this has happened for 1.5 billion years. The plankton are consumed by fish. In the 20th century, the active ingredient of fish oil was found to be vitamin D. And it was also found that UV radiation of the skin produced vitamin D. Plankton and our skin produce the oil 7-dehydrocholesterol, 7-DHC. And the action of the UV from the sun breaks a specific interatomic bond and converts the molecule into vitamin D. It was noted in Austria, Scotland, and in India that rickets and tuberculosis commonly occurred together in the same families. In Austria and Scotland, it was almost entirely in poor families. But in India, it was almost entirely in wealthy families. This was in the early 20th century. The poor spent their time not indoors or in factories, but in the fields exposed to the sun. It was the wealthy who remained indoors. By the mid 20th century, I'm sorry, by the mid 19th century, a clinical trial had demonstrated that cod liver oil would help in the cure of tuberculosis, or perhaps the control of tuberculosis in individuals. But at that time, vitamin D itself was not known. About 100 years ago, the importance of the sun in curing both rickets and tuberculosis was demonstrated. But this was ahead of its time, and the clinical science of immunology had not evolved. Vitamin D has effects on bones, immunity, and other parts of the body, including the central nervous system. The pandemic of COVID-19 has given us a great deal of understanding about the importance of vitamin D in immune defense. But the very sophisticated basic science underpinning this had developed since 1980. 
the ignorance of vitamin D among our medical and scientific government advisors is very regrettable and has been responsible for a large number of deaths. Vitamin D deficiency remains very common and it continues, but this should not be happening. About 500 million years ago, a complex protein evolved and we now call it VDR, standing for vitamin D receptor. It is found inside immune and other cells, but it needs to be joined by vitamin D in its activated form before it can switch on appropriate genes. These genes upregulate defensive immunity and downregulate the genes that control the cytokine storm. Vitamin D, VDR, controls T cells, B cells, memory cells, macrophages. It activates about 10% of our total genes. By nature, vitamin D deficiency becomes more common the further north we live from the equator, as the intensity of the sun and the length of the summer diminish. In the USA, in April, there is plenty of vitamin D produced in the southern states, but reducing amounts as we move north. Additional factors for vitamin D deficiency are indoor work, extensive clothing, and an exaggerated fear of the sun. In hotter temperate zone countries, people tend to spend more time indoors during the day and then to socialize outdoors in the evenings after the sun has set. Indoor in air conditioning can be much more comfortable than being outside in the heat. There is also the important issue of continuing atmospheric pollution which blocks UV reaching our skin. This is seen now in the major cities of Asia, especially in the populous nations of China and India. Pollution is not just from car exhaust fumes, but also from dust and sand in the air, anything that reduces light penetration. There are two seasons to the year. The vitamin D production season from April to September, and the vitamin D deficiency season from October to March. We can see here the dramatic benefit of the vitamin D production season on deaths each day from COVID-19 in the UK during 2020. Vitamin D is stored in the liver for use during the deficiency season, but reserves become low by January and February, hence an excess of infections and deaths during these months. Most of our vitamin D, about 90%, comes from our skin. It is initially carried in the bloodstream to the liver, where it is activated to become 25-hydroxy vitamin D, also known as calcifidiol. This is the form in which it circulates in the blood until it is needed. It is then taken into cells where it is further activated to 125 OHD, which joins with VDR, vitamin D receptor. The fully activated form of vitamin D is therefore 125 OHD, also called calcitriol. Each molecule can only be used once, and then it is inactivated to 2425 OHD. This prevents a toxic buildup but it means that there must be a constant supply of 25 OHD circulating in the blood. People with ethnically determined melanin-rich dark skin are at particular risk of vitamin D deficiency when they are living closely closer to the North Pole than to the equator. And they're also at great risk of developing COVID-19 during the, during the uh, recent or the present pandemic. Melanin in the skin is a natural sunscreen and of great importance and advantage when living in the tropics or in semi-tropical countries. But when in Northern Europe or North America, 
melanin blocks the relatively weak UV radiation so that vitamin D production is seriously impaired. It is not a coincidence that in temperate zones such as the UK, people with ethnic dark skin have both a high incidence of serious vitamin D deficiency and also a particularly high death rate from COVID-19. During six weeks from March the 23rd, 2020, 25 working doctors in the UK died from COVID-19. 24 of them, each shown here, that is 96% of the total, would have black African or South Asian ethnicity. Their deaths have not influenced the government denial of the importance of vitamin D during the pandemic. They effectively died in vain and nothing was learned by the scientists at the center of the nation. Such as those in SAGE. SAGE is our standing advisory group for emergencies in the UK. It is supposed to be made up of the, of the most clever people in the country, but I have my doubts about that. On September the 24th, it produced this absurd statement, dismissing the well-known deficiency of vitamin D as responsible for the high death rate among ethnic black and Asian people in the UK. It is beyond belief. We have also seen the devastating effect of the COVID-19 pandemic on the elderly, who could easily have been protected by adequate vitamin D supplements. They have been offered the lowest possible dose of vitamin D in the pretense of protecting them from osteomalacia, the adult form of rickets, and muscle weakness, completely ignoring the optimization of immunity by correcting vitamin D deficiency. Young skin can produce plenty of vitamin D on exposure to ultraviolet, but the performance of the skin in the elderly produces much less vitamin D. The elderly are inevitably deficient of vitamin D. They have thin, dry skin that is not capable of producing enough of the oil 78C. Therefore, it does not matter how long a very old person sits in the sun. Adequate vitamin D cannot be produced. Vitamin D by mouth is essential. The poor, as in this painting by Ellis Lauer in the 1930s, have been badly affected by the pandemic. They have been shown in the past to be vulnerable to vitamin D deficiency. My personal research showed that people who live in houses without gardens have lower blood levels of vitamin D compared to those with gardens. Where to sit when the sun shines? Very obvious for me with my garden, but not so obvious for people without a garden. These industrial style houses in England are horizontal, but a vertical apartment block would create the same problem. Although we ideally obtain about 90% of our vitamin D from the sun, it is possible to obtain sufficient vitamin D from the diet, as, tra as has traditionally happened with people who live in the Arctic. It requires eating seafood and oily fish three times a day. I have seen in my work people who I would expect to be deficient of vitamin D, but who had excellent blood levels by doing exactly this, eating fish three times a day. One was a man originally from Bangladesh who ate lots of Bangladeshi fish, which he obtained frozen from a local supermarket. The other was a man confined to the house because of severe learning disability. But his carer told me the only thing that he would eat was prawns three times a day. It might be imagined that the vitamin D that we can buy in the pharmacy and elsewhere would come from cod liver oil, but not now. The vitamin D that we take by mouth comes from sheep's wool. 
furry animals, especially when vegetarian, produce in their skin 7-DHC, just as we do. It stays on the surface of the skin and in the fur, where the action of the sun converts it into vitamin D. The animals obtain their vitamin D by licking their fur. But carnivorous animals can also obtain vitamin D by eating vegetarian animals. When sheep are sheared in the summer, the oils can be washed with an organic solvent. And this is done on an industrial scale in Australia and New Zealand. The solvent is then shipped to China where the oil is extracted. It is exposed to UV radiation to complete the conversion of 7-DHC into vitamin D. Then the vitamin D is purified, but I do not know of the industrial processes in any detail. When vitamin D was first discovered, it could not be measured chemically or physically, but like insulin, it could be assayed by its biological effect. And then its effect was expressed as units. One unit of vitamin D is defined as the daily requirement of a 10 gram immature mouse. And here we see three immature mice weighing approximately 10 grams. They set up home in a purple uh, plant pot in my greenhouse. And I discovered them during a tidying up exercise earlier. It is now possible to determine by physicochemical processes that one unit of vitamin D weighs 25 billionths of a gram, a very small amount. So we can scale up from one unit for a 10 kilogram, for a 10 gram mouse to a 60 kilogram human. And this becomes a daily requirement of 6,000 units or 12,000 units for someone weighing 120 kilograms. Taking half these doses is both effective and safe. I weigh slightly more than 60 kilograms and I take 3,000 units daily, usually as 20,000 units every Sunday. I've done so for about 25 years. And this is what I would recommend for all non-obese adults. Obviously, we would give less to children, perhaps 1,000 units per day, and more for the obese, depending on weight. I have an excellent blood level of 60 nanograms per mil, or 150 nanomoles per litre, the upper limits of the ideal range. Unfortunately, there are two forms of units in use. So be careful when you find out your number. Because vitamin D is stored in the body, taking a single dose each week is fine. Ideally, 20,000 units. And if forgotten, there is no problem. It can be taken on a subsequent day or a double dose the following week. The same dose is required irrespective of skin color. The official advice concerning dose varies from country to country, but in the UK, it is 400 units each day. This is a small amount, probably adequate to avoid rickets in the child. But our official bodies seem to be unaware of the role of vitamin D in immunity. The escalation of immunity at the time of the COVID-19 pandemic required a good reserve of vitamin D a much higher blood level than is required to avoid rickets. Our official advice tells us that up to 4,000 units each day is perfectly safe. 3,000 or 4,000 units each day, the dose is not critical. D3 is vitamin D from an animal source and D2 is from fungi, not quite as good. Public Health England has discouraged family doctors from requesting blood vitamin D levels on their patients. But experience during the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us the importance of the blood level. 
and that low blood levels give a high risk of death. We can see this in the example from Iran. About 10 nanograms per day, 25 nanomils per litre, sorry, nanomils per mil, 25 nanomils per litre is dangerous. And it is this level that is found in people who die from COVID-19. At about 20 nanograms per mil, 50 nanomils per litre, serious illness can occur, but death is less of a risk. Greater than, na seven, greater than 30 nanograms per mil, 75 nanomoles per litre, is much more safe, usually with no symptoms. It is ideal to aim at a range of 40 to 60 nanograms per mil, which is 100 to 150 nanomoles per litre. As I have shown, my blood level is at the top end of this range. I emphasize this level is perfectly safe and in my opinion, ideal. The very low number of deaths from COVID-19 that the UK and other countries experienced uh, in August 2020 indicates that the population had a good level of immunity at that time. This shows the importance and effectiveness of the sun. But we need to recreate the summer health in the winter using vitamin D by mouth. Some people choose to spend the winter living closer to the equator or even in the Southern Hemisphere, but this luxury is not available to all. The winter in the Northern Hemisphere, in the Northern temperate countries, creates the problem. If people were to take vitamin D by mouth during the winter, it would be sensible to check blood vitamin D levels in midwinter, and the daily dose can be adjusted if necessary. It is said that vitamin D excess can be dangerous, but this is exceptionally rare. In the UK this year, we've had more than 4 million cases of COVID-19, but I doubt if there has been a single case of vitamin D toxicity. There are just occasional reports in the literature, and they occur from and the cases occur from error. The blood level of calcium rise increases, and this is readily checked. It is readily reversible. 4,000 units of vitamin D sounds to be, be a big number, until you remember the mouse. 4,000 units is also 100 micrograms, a conversion factor of 40. People generally have no contact with or understanding of micrograms unless they work in a scientific environment. A microgram is a millionth of a gram, something so small that it can probably not be seen. People often assume that a microgram is a milligram, and I have seen this in the press. The confusion is made worse by the abbreviations. MCG, MUG, UG for microgram, and MG for milligram. If someone were to take 100 milligrams of vitamin D instead of 100 micrograms, they would be taking 4 million units of vitamin D each day, not 4,000. This is how vitamin D toxicity occurs, a dose error by a factor of a thousand. Fortunately, it is rare, but I recommend keeping to units. Incidentally, if vitamin D is taken all the year round, any excess will be inactivated by sun exposure during the summer when the blood circulates through the skin. It looks as though we might be close to the end of the pandemic of COVID-19 in the UK, the 2020 Numbers are shown in the blue graph line and 2021 in the green. It looks as though we have just about reached herd immunity. Many people, including myself, have individually or collectively tried since March 2020 to bring to the attention of governments the importance of protecting the population against the new virus COVID-19 
by correcting widespread vitamin D deficiency and thereby optimizing defensive immunity. Our many letters have been ignored by governments and the potential of vitamin D has been rejected. The official advisors such as SAGE and NICE, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, has stated that there is not enough evidence to allow the use of harmless and inexpensive vitamin D hormone of which most people are deficient. This is an absurd statement. Is it ignorance of the members of these bodies? Or is it ignoring and denying what they really know? This is the mystery. I and others with great knowledge of vitamin D have clearly lost the war of trying to influence governments. We are clearly winning the guerrilla war and this must continue. A large proportion of the population now take vitamin D, about 45%, according to one recent study. 72% of doctors take and advise vitamin D. Sales of vitamin D in pharmacies are at an all-time high. We must continue to inform the public, but also we need to create a higher profile of the importance of vitamin D in the medical and scientific professions and in their professional bodies. In anticipation of winter infections and excess deaths, we must correct vitamin D deficiency. The vulnerability of ethnic Africans and South Asians living in the UK and other temperate countries must be explained in terms of easily reversible vitamin D deficiency and it must be corrected. We must not see in the future the large number of simultaneous burial, burials, as in this example, the Muslim cemetery in Bradford, a city in Yorkshire with a large Muslim population. The inability of the elderly to produce vitamin D must also be acknowledged and their deficiency must be corrected. This, if this is not undertaken by public health bodies, the guerrilla war by social media must continue. I and others are not cranks. We have a great deal of knowledge concerning health and Ill illness, immunology and vitamin D. We are very sensitive to deaths of people when that is not necessary. We are not aiming to give a simple diet supplement but we aim to correct the widespread and often very serious deficiency of an essential vitamin hormone. We must correct misinformation. A public health profile is essential. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>